Are you interested in collective impact, but maybe you feel that the model is too rigid? Well, today I'm going to be talking about an article titled Collective Impact 3.0, uh, Evolving Framework for Community Change. This article was actually written a while ago, but I'm revisiting it now because a group of people from the Collective Impact Action Summit and I are interested in starting up a reading group or at least we're exploring the option. We're going to be meeting on June 30th at 9.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time. If you're interested in joining, please let me know by sending me an email. Depending on how this goes, we might do it again. The article starts off by talking about some of the limitations with the initial uh, framing of the model. One being that there isn't enough focus on community change and there's too much focus on short-term outcomes. Another challenge they mention is not enough focus initially on systems change and also potentially too much investment in the backbone as opposed to some of the other things that make a collective impact initiative really work. Another thing they mentioned is not enough lessons being taken from other collaborative models. Now, I thought this was very interesting and I actually looked up some of these models. I won't go into details in this video, but let me know in the comments below if you'd like me to make another video exploring some of these models. One of these models is Needle Moving Collaboratives and these are collaboratives that have at least one outcome that showed it at least a 10% uh, difference in community level wide indicators. Interestingly, some of these collaboratives are actually collective impact initiatives themselves. Another model that was mentioned is Aspen's comprehensive community initiatives. These also have different components or aspects that sort of frame the work. And finally, you have Hardwood's turning outward model. And this one is really about community engagement. What the article really focuses on is some of the things they wish would be shifted in the future when we're thinking about collective impact initiatives. And they use the various components of the collective impact framework to sort of guide the description of these shifts. The first shift that the article describes is moving from a management style of doing community work to a movement building style of doing community work. Now, there's a lot of reasons why you might do this. In the article, they talk about how a lot of times when something is being managed, instead of seeking to transform it, we're really working around the edges and we are incentivized to keep the system going as it is for the most part with minor improvements. One quote from the article that I really enjoyed is the following. In a movement building approach, by contrast, the emphasis is on reforming, even transforming systems where improvements alone will not make a difference. So as you see here, it's a number of things that are really different about movement building. One, it's including more people from different backgrounds. And I would probably say that in Collective Impact, what they're really encouraging you to do is to include people with lived experience who are dealing with the challenge or the wicked issue you and your collaborators are seeking to solve. My building doesn't happen overnight. It's the sort of work that takes a lot of time and effort. And it's why a lot of collective impact initiatives actually partner with community organizers. Another shift this article talks about is moving from a community agenda to community aspirations. The article also describes what a true agenda includes. It means bringing collaborators together, having them review data related to the topic, using those data to develop strategies, and finding the common ground. The idea here is that we're focusing on the aspirations our community has, so what we envision for the future, as opposed to trying to focus in on the challenges we're facing. Now, this really reminded me of appreciative inquiry, and I've talked a little bit about appreciative inquiry in the past, and I'm exploring it a little more in the future, so make sure to stay tuned for that. When you're engaging in appreciative inquiry, it doesn't mean that we are going to ignore the problems or ignore the challenges. What it really focuses in on is making sure that we're thinking about 
actively the future we want to build and the sorts of strategies that are going to be needed in order to work towards that future. Another shift the article talks about is about centering strategic learning as opposed to shared measurement. Here, a shared measurement is just another set of indicators that you look at. It's not the end all be all to your data strategy. Instead, you're really thinking about what sort of data you need in order to make decisions, in order to learn from the work you're doing so that you can make improvements. Uh, identify new, better strategies to move forward with. The article actually outlines some of the things you should be looking into, namely getting real-time feedback, developing data collection systems that are actually manageable, including processes that facilitate sense-making and decision-making. And they also call out that your strategies should shift through time, which means that your data collection processes and tools are going to shift as well. And as I have shared in the past in other videos, people are interested in data when the data are useful to the work they're doing. So figuring out what your team actually needs to make decisions, to make improvements, to make um, thoughtful conclusions about the work you're doing and how successful it is, that's going to be the focus of your data strategy as opposed to just identifying a list of indicators that will let you know if you are on the right track. That's important and it's something that you will do as well, but the focus is on learning. Another shift that the article is encouraging us to make is to move away from only focusing on mutually reinforcing activities and move our focus to thinking about high leverage activities. So the article goes into some details about why we might be limiting ourselves when we only focus on mutually reinforcing activities. For example, sometimes the strategies where there is consensus to move forward from all our collaborators are not the highest leverage uh, activities. Also, focusing on just mutually beneficial strategies might be limiting our exploration of other strategies. Plus, it might limit who can take action. Recently, I talked about the landscape diagram. Coalitions and collective impact initiatives fall in this middle area where there might not be 100% certainty that specific strategies may work, but also there may not be 100% agreement from collaborators about what work to move forward with and what is the best strategy. So if we wait for consensus, we might be limiting our ability to really engage in those high leverage strategies. And we might be waiting and waiting forever to achieve that consensus. Another shift that this article encourages us to make is to move from continuous communication to inclusive engagement. The article describes that usually when we think about continuous communication, we think about mobilizing a group of collaborators, building trust among the, that group of collaborators, and then structuring meaningful meetings so that we can get to meaningful work. And what's missing here is that we left out the ultimate beneficiaries. The article encourages us to think about the ultimate beneficiaries as part of our collaborator cohort. There's a number of reasons why, and they talk about some of them in the article. For example, it provides more perspectives to a particular issue, and having these added voices might help us identify solutions that will actually work. Another reason to do this is that it will help develop buy-in from the community. It's also the democratic thing to do. It's uh, allowing people who you are planning to have an influence on uh, input in the decisions that are being made about them. And the article also talks about how authentic and real community engagement is what's going to ultimately lead to real transformational change. Another shift the article encourages us, us to make is to move from viewing the backbone as an entity that should be supported and instead viewing the backbone as a container for change. 
Now, they talk about some of the things that the backbone should be doing, namely mobilizing a diverse set of funders, facilitating the growth of collaborators so that they are open to changing the way things are done, cultivating trust so that people feel comfortable engaging in real discussions about difficult issues and feeling comfortable with navigating some of those power dynamics. The backbone should also be balancing some short-term wins with some of these longer-term changes we're seeking to influence. And finally, and I think very importantly, the backbone should be sustaining interest in the Collective Impact Initiative so that we can learn together through multiple cycles without losing morale. One quote that I liked that this article shared is the following. You cannot force commitment. What you can do is nudge a little here, inspire a little there, and provide a role model. Your primary influence is the environment you create. So what this really makes me think about is making sure you're thinking of the habits or patterns you are trying to establish in your collect coalition so that you can lean on those habits and lean on those powers through and through and continue to make change happen. So I don't think what they're saying is to stop funding the backbone. I think what they're saying is that we should be thinking about the backbone as an agent for change as opposed to the organization that is going to make the change happen. The backbone is the convener. The backbone is the facilitator. The backbone is the connector. And the collaborators around the room are the ones that are using the resources the backbone is able to obtain to make change happen. If you read this article, I'd be curious to hear what you think I got wrong. If you can join us on the 30th, I really encourage you to do so. We are meeting uh, on Zoom at 9.30 Pacific Standard Time. Um, feel free to send me an email if you would like to join. And let's say it's beyond June 30th, 2023, when you actually come across this video and you want to engage with me in other ways, make sure to join my mailing list. That's where I will post any updates on upcoming reading events or any other thing I'm involved in.